So uh, people ask uh, what I do as the core curriculum coordinator for biology, and I tell them the actual title is a fancy way of saying chief cat herder. My job is to get 24 faculty, 24 graduate students, and around 1,400 undergraduates corralled into five different laboratory courses every semester. So it's um, interesting. But it also has given me the opportunity to play with a lot of different things. And so some of those have ultimately grown into what we now call the ADAPA project. But what I'm going to talk about today is um, primarily associated with BioBook, which has uh, consumed my life for about the last five years. And um, I'll show you a little bit about it, but uh, I want to focus on the data we've been getting from it. But also, I think it's important that you understand the rationale and why we see uh, the need for some of the things that we're doing. So I'm um, going to also take a uh, bit of advice from Don Milam, who's the uh, head of the uh, NSF's new IUSE grant program on uh, learning education. He said, we want to know what doesn't work just as much as what does. And that was in talking about how to design grants uh, for this new competition. But I'm going to, uh, rather than tell this nice monolithic tale that everyone um, is going to go, mm-hmm, yeah, all right. I actually want to tell warts and all stories. I'm going to tell you both the good, the bad, and the, well, that didn't work side of it. I'm going to tell you about uh, the NGLC trial and what we learned from that, but also the uh, small cohort trial that we ran um, a few, uh, about uh, 14 months ago started and uh, finished up about uh, eight months ago. And if we have time, we'll talk about uh, the open access project that we've uh, just started. But um, the projects are going to weave together. So it won't be a seamless story, but it will all mesh, and you'll see how they connect. So I'm sure everyone in this group knows that analytics is going to face a number of adoption challenges. Now, some of those are going to be intrinsic. A project's got to be simple for the faculty to adopt. If it's going to take a huge amount of work, they're not going to go for it. To apply, to interpret. If it requires a master's degree in advanced calculus or a PhD in applied statistics, chances are it's not going to work. You've also got to be able to act on it. You can generate a lot of data that just won't lead to an actionable uh, response. How do you get your students helped? But what we've run into are some additional problems as we're trying to build out and make our project more extrinsic. Scalability, local adaptation, and resistance. Some of it's coming from the faculty. A lot of it comes from the students. But we also get administrative resistance. And I'll tell you a little bit about, more about these as we go. So this is a yeah, moderately successful project. Yeah, you may have heard of it. Um, this is the eCoach project, um, Tim McKay's project, that was funded by the NGLC. Um, and I, I hold this up sort of as my Oh, please let me get there someday. Um, but I, would, I think everybody would agree this is an intrinsically successful project. Um, it's created information that can be acted on and that there's a large buy-in for. And there are other projects like this, the uh, Purdue Signals Project. Uh, there are a number of them out there. But its scale also creates a barrier. And I'll show you what that barrier is. Look at the key words, thousands, hundreds, dozens. Now that's great when you have 20,000 students currently enrolled. It also is wonderful when you have the thing that we all envy, which is the Michigan Data Warehouse. Um, access to that is something that just about everyone else in the country would love to have. And what we would all agree that we would say to students, when you start going beyond one institution, that becomes an enormous challenge. So what I'm going to talk about is the problem of being small scale or artisan. 
Now, and, and where that boundary lies, I'll show you in just a moment. But the routine assumptions of analytics, that there's a large data set and that the data are available and accessible, you can get uh, actionable points, and that they're implemented are very frequently invalidated when you go to institutions that are about uh, my size. Wake Forest has a population of just under 5,000 on its undergraduate campus. None of those are true for us. Schools targeting at-risk students. There are a lot of schools that are now specializing in targeting students of minority status, uh, first generation to college. We have an especial problem in North Carolina because in the western half of the state we have a large population from southern Appalachia. These are children who are coming from families of very little financial means and poor schools and they are the first generation to college. They're coming in with multiple risk factors. There's also a problem when looking at analytics of, of the individual instructor. What if an instructor wants to try something and wants to do uh, some kind of analytics with their students in one class? That becomes very difficult. Mixed consortia, which is what we're involved with, becomes a real problem because of the different institutions. And also grassroots projects. Anybody who wants to start analytics who doesn't have an institutional support network is going to have a very hard time with this. Now, I'm a biologist, card-carrying trained. Um, we call it uh, blood and guts. Um, and in fact, I was a cardiovascular biologist, so that's appropriate. Um, but I moved into analytics um, and learning uh, strategies in education from that traditional model. And in biology, there's a rule. People go into biology in spite of their classes, not because of them. Because the vast majority of students struggle in biology. Two uh, 2013, the ACT said one in four students was not ready for college STEM. 25% nationally. The NSF said one in three students are going to fail their introductory biology course the first time they take it. One in three. National uh, Center for Education Statistics, 2012, said IntroBio, which I'm going to call Bio 101, is the sixth most commonly taken course on college campuses. 14% of all degrees awarded in the United States are either life science or require a, a general biology class in order to get that degree. About one in four community college students take it. But among the students who fail a class and don't come back, 18% of the kids who don't complete their intro bio in a community college are going to ultimately leave the school. So biology is a significant barrier for a lot of students. And that's how NGLs, why NGLC, um, or part of the reason, that they selected us for the Wave 1 program was that biology is the only science course that's considered a gateway. The other uh, gateway courses are typically math and language. So in, in getting ready for the NGLC grant, one of the things we did was we did standard power analysis to find out how many data points we were going to need to have. It's fairly standard for a um, uh, project. We actually uh, looked to say how many student data points would we need in order to see an 8 to 10 percent change in student behavior. That's about one grade, one going to D to C. And uh, with an 80 percent power limit. So not real tight requirements. Found we would need about uh, 1,000 students in order to get that, uh, that power. Problem is, in order to have one population, we'd have to have an enrollment of 8,000. Assuming about 14% of your students are enrolled in biology within an institution, we have to have an enrollment of 8,000. That means for weight by itself, we wouldn't have enough to see that change without going multiple semesters or multiple years. 
And that's a significant challenge. So how are you going to be able to get even reasonable data? It gets to be an even bigger problem when you go down to the smaller schools. Now, these uh, enrollment numbers <coughs> are broken up into what we consider the very small schools, small to mid-size, anything above about 5,000, you're talking large, at least according to the National Center for Education Statistics. So how many students are we talking about impacting? This is Central North Carolina. That's Wake Forest. And this map actually shows all the schools that are within about a comfortable hour drive of Wake Forest. The size of the circle is directly proportional to the size of the school. That's Wake. We've got five schools just within the city limits. We have 27 that are within a one-hour drive. Those are the ones that have enrollments of 8,000 or higher. 23 out of 27 schools have enrollments below that. And this is not unusual. If you look uh, at uh, enrollment across the country, what you'll find is if you look at uh, public institutions like University of Michigan, about 38% of students come to schools that are considered public four year. And if you look at the size, 34% or 35% of the students are going to large schools where traditional analytics models are going to work well. But if you look at two year schools, 36, 37 percent of students go, start out at least in those schools. And of those, about uh, eight and a half out of 36 or 22 percent of all students going to two-year colleges are going to what we call artisan schools, small schools. You go to the privates, fully 45 percent of our students are going to small schools. Schools of 800, 1,000. Small school that uh, we have in our region has only 400. Very small schools. Here's where we got really interested. The problem of the at-risk student. North Carolina, as I said, has a very large at-risk population. Those students tend to go preferentially to smaller schools. And in fact, they're often recommended to go. But if you add it up and look at the numbers, both public, private, and two-year and four-year, about 23%, or between one in four and one in five students overall are going to these smaller schools. And they're going to be disproportionately the at-risk students, the ones that analytics data could help be successful. So how do you actually create tools that allow you to do analytics in this kind of model, this kind of problem? We came up with the idea, and there's many reasons we did this, of targeting textbooks. Anybody seen a uh, current biology textbook lately? How big is it? That's it? 1,300 pages. And it's for two semesters. You're going to uh, uh, have your students read 1,300 pages in two semesters. Way too much. Now, textbooks have not fundamentally changed, except getting thicker and thicker and thicker, for biology in the better part of a century. Typical textbooks, bloated. I'm sorry, 1,300 pages is too much. In fact, SRI International out in Menlo Park did an analysis and found out they could throw out 56% of the average textbook with no loss of pedagogical content. 
We had an argument this morning with the uh, grads and postdocs about uh, the meaning of that, but still, throwing out more than half of a book and not losing anything, I think, is pretty telling. They're also costly, $275 plus. First generation to college students, that's a big chunk of money. Community college students, that's the difference between taking a course and paying the tuition or not. So it's an enormous problem. They also are static. They don't change. Um, books may have errors that go back decades. Um, I've got several examples of those. But the things that bother me uh, most are that there's such poor learning support. Um, in fact, uh, Perry, oh, I stole this from you. Yeah, so it's called sucking up to your hosts. <laughs> um, no, um, thank you. <laughs> I was going to use it anyway, but <laughs> the what we found, uh, what I thought Perry did a very good job at was was pointing out how the learning environment is mostly focused on lectures, note taking, students, uh, activities. But the textbook's out here by itself. And uh, this was the data that he presented back in 2012. If you add these up, about 90% of the time, students say the textbook's pretty much optional for the course. So if students feel like that they can be successful in a class, or even the professor says you can be successful without the book, it's not contributing that much to the learning process. So our idea was to improve the textbook, but also use it as a place for integrating different teaching strategies as well as tools for assessing the learning. And that's where BioBook came from. We call it a STEM teaching and learning ecosystem. It's only because we're a bunch of biologists we couldn't come up with a better way of saying a bunch of stuff together. So. What we did was we started with how we learn naturally. Started with basic learning theory, constructivism. Built on the idea, uh, and on that idea, and started bringing in best teaching practices from the literature. Once we had a really great idea, we then proceeded to simplify it and keep it as simple, clean, and easy to use as possible. And also we wanted to make it flexible and adaptable. And also scalable at low cost. Standard textbook uh, for biology is $275. We can offer bio book for $30 to our students. Um, and that's only to cover server costs. So how is it different? First of all, we focused on using open access materials, open educational resources, as much as possible. We also use questions to in, uh, introduce every last concept. People ask me, um, how do you distill down the ideas of teaching and learning to something everyone can understand? And I actually, it took me a couple of years, I figured it out. We learn most by asking questions and having experiences, not hearing statements. If you start with that idea, you can actually bring down to a very simple concept how to improve learning in a variety of ways. But we. Uh, built a tree format around the information in biology where it was put in a hierarchy so people could understand this was basic information and this was how to connect it together and this was a foundational concept. We call them roots, branches, leaves. Now we didn't decide on uh, what the roots should be. We let um, the AAAS uh, Vision and Change Initiative decide that for us. So we actually uh, adopted um, because um, some of us were involved in the initial meetings uh, for VCube. We actually uh, adopted their idea of information storage and flow, the flow of matter and energy. Those kinds of topics are our roots. Then we use branches to bring concepts together and then the basic information is in exchangeable elements called leaves. The tree format means that students can go exploring. We can give them an entire textbook, but their instructor may only assign a small piece. Instructors can adjust the book so it fits exactly what they need their students to learn. There's informal assessments embedded everywhere, and I'll show you those in just a minute. 
But the nice part is, is because it's online, we get to track what people are doing. And that's where we found out some really interesting things. These are three pages from BioBook. And these are actually from uh, the uh, fall 2013 edition. We've updated, um, so it's going to look a little different for anybody who goes on. Um, but information, um, I said, information would be in a root. Then you would have a branch. Now, root might have a dozen branches on it, and each branch having a dozen leaves. But you can reorganize these so that they fit what your students need. And every page is going to have different pieces of information, the basic content, learning goals. Check my learning. Guess what that is? This is the audience participation part. It's a quiz. What do you think is under learning goals? Learning goals. <laughs> think about it. I mean, when a student is reading, they don't remember the learning goals from the beginning of the semester on the syllabus. We put them right there. The information's there when they need it. Now, what do you think a student ought to be able to do when they finish reading this leaf? Exactly. Answer the question. What students should get out of the information is right up front. They, they know what you expect them to learn. And that's just a very basic way of getting them to think about it in the way they're going to be asked. Now, every, uh, where we can, we've embedded self-assessment. There are quiz questions embedded in every branch and every leaf. So students know what they're getting right and not. And we're actually tracking who answers these, whether they're answering them correctly or not, and how often. So this is analytics data that we're capturing. The other nice thing about BioBook is that nearly any resource that you can imagine on the web, you can bring in. Um, we've brought in uh, videos. We love YouTube and Vimeo and iBioSeminar. Um, Howard Hughes has a very nice library of seminar uh, videos. Um, the National Science Digital Library, Wikimedia Commons. All these resources we can bring in through links and extras. We can bring it in our active exercises. If you can find it, you can bring it in. Now, I, I can go on, and people tell me I go on too long, but uh, we don't have anybody here who likes to show off pictures of their babies, do they, or their children, do they? No, this is mine, so I have to be good. The reason we like buy a book strategy is because it adapts to a variety of instructional strategies. Regardless of the method you're teaching with, flip classroom, which is one I use, and case learning, learning communities, all of these can be accommodated using the same book. We're also getting students involved in contributing to the book. We use uh, BioBook as a platform for public writing. Students don't write for their instructor, they write for their entire class. And those of you who have, have done that can probably attest to the writing is less sloppy. Students take a greater stake in the writing when it's public. We've learned that. Um, we've also used it for near-peer instruction and for building collaborative learning objects. But is it actually working? If we don't know that, we're not going to get very far. So our goal for building the analytics toolkit for BioBook was by week three of a semester, we wanted to be able to flag a student who had a marker for getting a grade of D plus or lower. Most institutions, that's the lowest grade you can get, or that, uh, that's the first grade that you can get and be, uh, not get the course credit for, the, for your general education requirement. We also wanted to be able to identify students that were at risk of not doing well in the course so we could follow them 
provide resources that they might need before they got so far behind that they couldn't pass the course. And the intervention. We wanted to be able to provide some intervention that was consistent with what was in the literature. Sound pretty standard? Here's where it gets interesting. What we had to do is we had to create a model that uh, not only would achieve those goals, but also had to be flexible enough that we could change it for different institutions. We wanted to build it with validated instruments that were already published, make it automated, and make it simple enough that a single educator could implement it without any institutional support. In other words, we wanted to do analytics that were institutionally independent. Yeah. Challenge. And it also had to be sensitive to a small end. So as part of the NGLC grant, we actually built a two-week module as proof of concept for um, BioBook. And we had 300 non-majors and their instructors at four institutions test it for two weeks. Now, not shown up here, we also had co a matched cohort, 200 control students as part of this population. So we're looking at a total of 500. Wake Forest was a participant also, Winston-Salem State, which is an HBCU, Guilford Tech, our large community college nearby, Salem College, small women's college of 800 students, attracting almost entirely high risk and a very large international population. So very different populations that we had to be pulling data for. So where we were getting our data were from integrated student survey, and we were looking at general user satisfaction, but also general demographics. In terms of learning, we were using two instruments. Class Bio, which came out of Colorado. It's the uh, Colorado Learning Assessment. Class Bio. <laughs> uh, essentially, is looking at uh, students' knowledge relative to experts. Biological Concepts Inventory, Mike Klimkowski out at Boulder uh, developed this. And it's actually looking at the most common concepts in biology. We also looked at affect. How confident were students in their ability to perform daily activities the way scientists would? And that's the biology self-efficacy scale. For instructors, they were providing their satisfaction with the overall modules, but also student grades and withdrawal dates. Administration was expected to provide Pell status, whether the students had Pell grants which is a proxy for financial risk, students who are at risk of not completing because of their financial need. Now, in a one-year project, it's kind of hard to track graduation rates. So what we did instead, and this was at the recommendation of NGLC, was to track persistence. How many students came back the next semester? Well, I said this was going to be a warts and all story. Hard lesson number one. Just because the data are available doesn't mean you can have them. We found tremendous institutional barriers. One institution actually told us, after we had our IRB approval and we had student consent, and the project was already underway, that they would provide health status data if every student would appear in the Office of Financial Aid during business hours and produce a photo ID that was not a state driver's license or their student ID and sign a separate waiver form. In other words, they didn't want to give it to us. That was, um, we did find a way around that. We actually found the easiest way was just to ask the students directly. I mean, they had no problem. Oh, sure, here. And tell us right on survey. Uh, data sharing was also a problem. Just because data are available, um, we actually had one that we got our data, we asked and we got the final report one year later, one day before it was due on our final report to the NGLC. That kind of resistance. So despite the that, Sure. The, one of the questions I ask myself is the, the, the data 
stores are kind of cropping up in the, in, all over the place. So the institutions have them, but there's also companies that have them and so forth. Mm -hmm. Is there a market growing for the sharing of that data? Where, where th there's a market driven driving down of the cost of sharing that data, but you're actually trying to generate useful data because somebody else might want it? The problem is uh, that, and it's one that we've run into repeatedly at our own institution, is conservatism about FERPA. There is such a fear that we're going to violate FERPA that they're unwilling to provide data. I've had it, um, we were actually talking about this um, when we were talking about the uh, IRB uh, for projects. The I a lot of the data is not that useful yet, is what I think. And I'm trying to figure out what's going to drive the, the creation of useful data and what's going to engage people to actually create useful data. I think the first thing is just going to be access to data. I think you've already hit on it that there's this growing availability of data warehousing, data management, data mining tools, but that data are not available, or the data are not available. They, there's just not access to large data sets. I mean, for instance, I can access my own institutional data, but I have to spend a lot of time on the phone working to get this data from other institutions. And that's, that's something we're running into. As we expand the project, we're getting that more and more often, not less and less. So I'm thinking that it's just getting people to agree to allow that data out. It's probably the single biggest barrier that I see. But, but that's, what I'm, that's, what I, that's why I'm pointing out that does, is there a financial piece of this that would actually make sense where people would say, yeah, this is, this is the exchange. The data is useful. Other people are, are using it for their system. There is an incentive, but there's also a tremendous disincentive. And that is a lot of institutions don't want that information public. Because then it says something about how effective they are. And that's, that's a very touchy subject. People are very are institutionally, and I know I'm speaking on a massive generalization, so I know there are exceptions to this, and, and Michigan's one of them. Um, so um, count yourselves very lucky. There, there are a lot of institutions that are adamant they will not allow performance data out in any way. And we've run into that in several of the, we've actually had to disinvite potential partners for that reason. It's a tangent, but I just wanted to. Yeah. Yes. And what sometimes appears like institutional resistance is simply people not uh, not understanding the nature of the request and being then granted permission by their boss to, well, of course you should, you know, of course you should do that. I I agree. I mean, we we've actually seen both. So, um, yeah, the, these these are the realities of going out into multiple institutions. We. By going out and, and talking to 10 and 20 institutions at a time, you very quickly find out where your barriers are going to be. And, and just access to the data has been probably one of our priorities in saying, sorry, we can't partner with you. <clears throat> so what did students and instructors actually think of BioBook? Now, realize we're talking about two weeks. But after two weeks, students, uh, and we've since run this on full semester data, uh, with full semester version of BioBook, but in the initial two-week trial, we found out that about two out of three students felt it was easier to understand when they were using BioBook versus a traditional textbook. 78% said it was easier to track their learning progress, which I know is a huge challenge. Connecting concepts, much easier. One of the things that I always focus on when dealing with students in biology is what do you not know? And how do you know you don't know it? The metacognitive step. 
we actually asked students how, uh, how well they could do that. 95% said it was easier to see. I don't know that yet. I need to work on it. 83% wanted to use a full version. Sounds pretty good. Um, faculty also uh, felt similarly. Interest of time, I want to go on. But about 89% uh, said they wanted the full version as well. So based on that, we thought, okay, we need to make the full version. But did it actually improve the learning outcome? Now, you have to take this in uh, the context of we're looking at numbers for a two-week intervention in a one-semester course. When we look at course completion, really no statistical difference between our control and mean. Mastery, which means getting a grade of C or higher. Um, Unfortunately, we had one faculty member who their definition of uh, learning was a little um, old-fashioned, shall we say. And their students, their class average was a D. So that, unfortunately, brought us down. Um, persistence, we didn't see any difference. Um, we did, unfortunately, see a drop in deeper learning, according to the biological concepts inventory. But again, one of our test uh, faculty had a very stilted teaching style, and we feel that may have uh, diluted out the data. But on the biological self-efficacy scale, we actually found, not statistically significant, but after two weeks, already students are feeling like, maybe I can do this. Now, I forgot to tell you, the topic we actually chose for this was, was genetics the topic that, one of the two topics that students most often say they have trouble with, the other being evolution and natural, history, natural selection. We also got a very nice bump in their attitudes towards biological science. So these are, two, and these are the BCI, BSCS, and Class Bio are all published validated instruments. So we aren't faced with the challenge of having to do that from scratch. What we have the advantage of doing is taking what's already out there and bringing it in and making it available to our partners. Well, it's not enough just to say what we're learning about our students. We want to actually be able to predict from their behaviors whether they're going to be successful. So We've only had our full semester bio, uh, version of BioBook for about a year and a half now. Um, but we uh, ran our first trial with a small group of non-majors in spring of 2013. And what we asked was, will their use patterns and self-quizzing, how many quizzes they took, would that tell us anything about their final overall course grades? And for this, we actually, um, took an idea from the phylogenetics uh, research, um, phylogenetics field rather, and started using congruence testing. Uh, one of our uh, team members is actually a phylogeneticist by training and uh, brought this to us. It's a um, modeled in CADM and it's basically looking at the similarity between student activity and their course performance. Now the nice part about this model is it doesn't require a huge number of data points in order to uh, be used. This is, um, what you're looking at here are the number of pages that students read in BioBook. Top third, middle third, bottom third. And they're just ranked by number. So this student read 123 pages, this student read only 101. Now, the required reading for the class was 122 pages, so right here, is the expected reading. Under that, we then laid out top to bottom quiz grades. Again, highest third rated in uh, marked in blue, white's middle third, orange the bottom third. And then overall course grade marked the same way. Now, the way this was analyzed was using Euclidean distances. Um, basically, a similar pay, if a student has, two students have a similar number of pages read and a similar final score in their class. 
they're given a score that is smaller than two students that have similar number of pages, but their grades are different. And using uh, Kendall's W, uh, looking at concordance among uh, the cohorts and the experiments are looking at uh, the individual data sets. Um, what we found, well, I'm sorry, um, I should have put this first. Total number of pages assigned, 120. Nice part about this is already, even in visualization, which is another challenge for our partners, what do you think might be going on? Just eyeballing. Hmm? Okay. Nobody here. Oh, wait a minute. Do I have any statisticians? Oh, good. <laughs> I thought, uh oh. Um, with minimal background knowledge, you were able to interpret this visually. Idea again, we want to be able to give tools that the average instructor, who has surprisingly little time, to be able to analyze this. And in fact, what you just said is what the analysis told us. Now, these are very small correlations, but remember we're looking at a population of only 35. So we can already say that the overall congruence among the matrices is around 0.47. So we can say that there is a correlation between quiz grades and reading and quiz grades, I'm sorry, quiz grades, reading, and final grade. Um, I'm going to skip this. Um, we, we were looking to see how we break the system, and we found out that we can shorten it in. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, we can shorten it in and actually break the model, so we think that we're very close to the lower limit of what this model can do. Uh, but again, we're just starting to play with this, and so anybody who's got ideas on, on how to refine this model, I'd love to talk with you, either by phone or email. But I also want to point out um, a second hard lesson, and that is just because you have actionable information doesn't mean it's going to happen. This was something um, I think uh, five different people mentioned in slams that I read um, in preparing for this talk. Um, our students strongly avoided self-quizzing. We told them up front, if you quiz yourself, you'll get a better grade. We didn't have the data, but we figured that was a fairly safe assumption. And our students absolutely refused. To such a point that we only had about half of our students even attempt it. And we are looking at where that affect barrier is coming from. That's a question we're um, starting to ask the students this semester. Um, we, in fact, the, we had so little data that we couldn't even conduct the analysis looking at self-quizzing as a separate estimator of grade. We also, this was some, something I know several people have also talked about, we got frequent vocal complaints from our students about we were giving them too much information about their grades. They didn't want to know. But then they would say we weren't telling them enough. Okay, we, we need to give you more, but we don't need to give you any more. So again, we're, we're looking at that as an affect situation, and um, we are really just starting on that. But it is something that we're seeing, and it's not just us. I think this is fairly universal. But we'd like to be able to um, find some way of actually analyzing that in more detail. So where are we going in the future? We spent a lot of time looking at the smaller pieces of BioBook. And I've shown you two, two of the stories. There's a lot more going on. But right now, our priorities are we feel like we've at least got enough tools that we can start putting together an automated package where we can start building out for our partners 
and give them access to the CADM modeling. Um, right now, we're looking at um, integrating it as um, part of our uh, R package that's within BioBook. We're definitely going to be using Class Bio, BCI, and the BSES. Those, uh, we feel, are very good instruments. We're going to give us some good information. We're also, um, I didn't talk about it, but we've also identified about 35 risk markers that are either published or that we have evidence saying these are things that we know are associated with student having a higher than average risk of failing the course. Things such as first generation to college, um, single parent, uh, many of those you're very familiar with. Uh, the, we already talked a little bit about the uh, FERPL and, and local data sharing problem and student resistance. Um, we're also finding that how students are view by the book and how they're working with it depends heavily on their instructor. If their instructor pushes it, they'll use it. But if their instructor doesn't push it, they won't touch it. And this is, this is almost identical to what you see with traditional textbooks. So we're looking at how to um, train our instructors to actually uh, start using it. And we've uh, started building out some uh, modules for that. So I need to stop at one, correct? OK. Um, I will tell you, we um, have, um, anybody who's interested in using BioBook, I'll show you the address uh, where you can go take a look at it for yourself in just a minute. But I will tell you that in fall, uh, starting in August, we actually released BioBook. We didn't release all the tools. We keep those, but the actual content library is now publicly available. So anyone anywhere in the world can use it. And we did not actually use it in a class during the fall, but even without that, we had tw uh, just under 23,000 hits for open searching. And we've actually started using that to start finding what are the free run use patterns. We're finding some interesting things about who's coming in and using it and what their use pattern is. And we're also using it to start doing data analysis or text analysis to start pulling out some of the concepts that students are struggling with. Um, so I have to. I have to tell you about our team. We're on a small, we're on a uh, small scale analytics, and we got a small scale team. This is Dr. Jed McCoskos, the co-founder of the ADAPA project the Department of Physics. He um, and I wrote the initial grant that uh, launched this whole project back in 2007, an intramural grant. Um, his interest is in uh, using it for chemistry and physics. So we're, we're actually working on building out into chem book and phys book. And we're hoping, um, we're supposed to hear very soon whether or not we'll have the funding to be able to do that. Um, this is the Italian pit bull, or the Italian Doberman. Um, Dr. Sabrina Sotaro is the project director for um, the ADAPA project and for BioBook. Um, she is from Germany, um, but is from an Italian family. And the uh, reason I call her the uh, uh, Italian Doberman or the Italian pit bull, uh, and uh, she laughs about it because we have one of our projects is we have teaching genetics with dogs. So that's where the uh, joke came from. But uh, she actually. Um, once she gets hold of a project, we'll not let it go. And that's actually been to our benefit. Um, she actually does a mixture of writing, managing the students uh, who work with us, run, uh, cuts code, does algorithm development, uh, runs the database management, runs the website. Needless to say, we don't let her go. Incredible, uh, incredible talent. The two young women you see here are both undergraduates who worked with us for three years. Um, Jessica Martin, uh, who um, just finished at Wake, uh, has about 80% of the, t uh, the pages in BioBook have her editing marks on them. She's written uh, more than a, uh, written or co-written more than half of all the text. So she's incredible uh, commitment to the project. Her sister, um, Stephanie Blackburn, um, is the artist in the family. 
So a lot of the artwork that was created for BioBook actually came from her. So she's also been heavily involved in the Teaching Genetics with Dogs project. And of course, uh, the last group that I've got to thank are the Wake Forest students. We've gotten our best ideas from undergraduates working with us on the project. Um, of course, uh, our funding came from Next Generation Learning Challenge, also been funded by Wake Forest and the Kauffman Foundation. Um, also, won't have time to talk about, but uh, I've had some collaborating partnerships with Louise Arnell, and I'd also like to thank Odigia, uh, the online learning platform that helped us build the first generation for the NGLC tests. And if anybody wants to learn more about the ADAPA project, that's our address. And if you go to project spaces, you'll find a, a link directly to BioBook where you can explore it for yourself. And with that, I'll stop, say thank you for the invitation and your time. Mm -hmm. It's also helpful to repeat the question. Sure. All right. Yeah. Taking over a really interesting talk. I had two questions. Um, one, on the data that you showed before showing the comparison between the control and test groups, you had your slide on questions regarding whether it was easier or harder using BioBook and um, sort of efficacy in that regard. I just wanted, was wondering if you could clarify what they were basing that on. Was that based on their experience with previous modules in that course, or was it like their high school experience that this was an introductory the, That was one of the advantages we had in, uh, the, her question was, when we were looking at whether or not students preferred BioBook over a traditional model, how we were doing that and where our control group was. The, um, is that correct? So the, what we did actually was, because we had a two-week module, we actually had the students had their own textbook to compare to. So we had, had an internal control of, we were at four different institutions and all of them had different textbooks. So regardless of what the student's textbook was, they were comparing against what their standard was for their institution. So we had, um, they were doing each one of their own control. But not something I would have done in hindsight, um, but it was beneficial at the time. You said you had your other question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the question was, how do you um, integrate with something like Just-in-Time teaching where you're working with um, students quizzing, uh, quizzes to, to tell you information about whether, what they're having problems with, and you adjust accordingly, correct? So one of the advantages is that you can run quizzing inside of BioBook uh, or you can bring in another quiz module. Um, however you want to do it, you can bring that in and you can pick pretty much any way you want to. You can say, okay, this is required. It has to be done by a certain date. Your points depend upon it. You, have, you can't just give it free reign. I mean, the assessments we have are all intentionally designed that they're not required. It is all self-selected. But if you wanted to create quizzing, that can be done, and then you just simply make it mandatory. That, then you still get that data. The nice part is, is that every page is available that you can basically assemble the, the reading necessary to complement what you're seeing a problem with. Or if you find a resource that could help with that, you can just put it into the extras link, extras tab, and, and it's right there. Say, because we've actually started uh, experimenting with creating some very interesting hybrids. Because the nice part about uh, the Bible platform is it's an open uh, wiki-based HTML. And it takes about half an hour to learn the code. And if you forget it, there's a help button that tells you exactly. And you can actually build a, a page that says, all right, people have problems with this in, in this lecture. So I want you to go read this. And I want you to look at this video. And then we're going to do this in class. You can build that and have it for your students 
as soon as you know the information. As you talk about the platform itself and how do you how do you do the wiki basics, you know, editing things, are there things that you miss or that you wish were part of this platform that you uh, what I was I'm asking what as you develop this thing, everything I've developed I feel like it, I get to a point where I'm like, well this is the thing that that's the thing that whatever. I'm just curious what is what are the one, that was actually one of our biggest challenges was, uh, before I go on to that, did that answer your question? Okay. Um, so one of the challenges we had was coming up with a platform that allowed us to be able to ad adapt and change as we found out things. And really the only way of doing that was to establish very clear guidelines of it had to be something that we could adjust and change and modify on the fly. And that was the reason we broke with our initial partners at Odigia. They have a, a tremendous pro, uh, product, but it's fixed on the Moodle platform. And what Moodle can do is all we could do. And so what we did was we backed up and, and adopted a more flexible platform that allows us, if we need blogging, we bring it in. If we need forum systems, we bring it in. That essentially allows us to link anything, anywhere. We have control over it, but Pretty much, if you can write HTML code for it, you can put it in. So that's the, that was the approach we took, and, and it's worked for us. Um, we've, we've been able to put in some very interesting things that took maybe half an hour to get in. So you know, you'll get the idea at, I'm bad to work at midnight, and I'll get the idea, oh, I wonder if this will work, and by 1 a.m., it's in. So we've got that level of flexibility to put things in. Institutions then, so if you make changes, it's seen everywhere, or is it customizable per the instructor? We actually have three ways of doing it. Um, and that, again, the idea is we did not know what would be the ultimate goal. We had to get the data, so we had to have something that would adopt or, or adapt as, as we went. So, what we basically have is a CMS that we can host, and we host on an independent server, not on an institutional server. So, we have better control of it. Basically, what we can do is we can provide the current edition of BioBook, and that's the one that has the complete library. We have two options. We can either create a structure that an instructor would use on our server, or we can clone to a separate server, and they can take it and use it on theirs. We prefer they use it on ours. But if there is an issue that the institution they're working at does not want to operate that way, they don't want any student data off, and we can talk. Run the remote database? Can you just run the database into the institution? We're actually looking at there's some there's some firewall issues that we've run into. I must say it's not solvable. But you saw our skeleton crew. I mean, um, I am half of the HTML database team, okay. and I learned it as I went. Okay. So it's we we could have a lot of fun if I could, if you give me an HTML uh, coder and a uh, uh, MySQL database specialist we'd be dangerous because <laughs> we could do these kinds of things. But right now, we've been able to do this, and, and it still keep the costs down. For an institution, um, if they've got the server space, they can run this for their students and essentially give them a textbook, which is a tr tremendous resource for your students if they don't have to worry about that. Right. So could you speak to how BioBook, what strategies are implemented and how that works for you? Okay. So first question was, remind me again, please. How, uh, first question was how does a student customize? One of the things we have the ability to do is set very fine-grained permissions um, on everything we do. So what we can do is we can actually set it up so that a student can read in whatever order they want to. And they don't have to follow the set pattern. Um, if it makes sense for the, some students learn better by getting the specific example and then moving back to the theory. Others learn the opposite way. So we've set it up where students can see what pages they'll need to be reading and what they're expected to learn as they go. So they can pick and choose where they're going. 
That's the first option. That's, that's fairly basic. But what we've been working with, and it's still not there yet, give me another four months and it will be, um, we, because we need it by summer. What we want to be able to do is actually give students the ability to take the pages and build their own structures. The, the permissions to do that are a little tricky because we have to give them permission to do administrative level activities, which is not something I want to do. Um, but I, it's, it's a solvable challenge. We just simply have got the, gotten the code written to do it. But in the meantime, we do have the ability that students can, as they read, they can take notes and they can mash up their own pages. So that technology is already there. And students can pull, essentially, notes that are pieces of the text. Um, plus, it's highlightable, and they can go in and do the traditional everything. Now, in terms of the second question was, how do we uh, provide for students with different risk factors? That's a, uh, an area where we're still working. We've, right now, our biggest thing we're finding is that in looking at learning style, we've got students where there's a mismatch between the learning style, and their, their struggle is that the way they learn is different than the way most teachers teach, and that's their risk factor. So we've been working on helping students identify that earlier. One of the things we're actually, um, I'm going to be working on as soon as I get back is integrating um, um, Felder's in, uh, inventory of learning styles from NC State. We're going to actually make that available to our students so they can test themselves and say, okay, maybe I need to start here. So it, it, it allows some self-identification. The, um, in terms of the others, um, we're still just too early to be able to establish uh, specifics, but the nice part is this system actually is very good at monitoring who's reading what and on the basis of that making recommendations. So it does have some ability to do that already. And the other piece that we're bringing in is we're hoping to be able to link pages based on if you're having trouble with this, you probably want to go over here. Now, there are about four different ways of doing that, and we have to pick the best way. And that, again, it's one of those items. The, the to-do list is now in two and three pages, and it's, it's definitely on the list. Um, we're not there yet. And we're not as far along as I'd like to be on that. Yeah? I found uh, you've, you've done a number of interesting things. You've got an interesting pedagogy, you've got uh, interesting content design, and you've got an interesting content management system. And so as you've been talking, I've been trying to tease apart in my mind which one might be uh, affecting students and how. And I'm wondering if you could just comment on how you're going to determine or, or how you might look at those different issues. That is, if I took Blackboard or Sakai and built this whole book inside of it, mm -hmm. is that different? Does it, is it the platform that matters? Is it the pedagogical approach that matters? Is it the quality of the content writing that matters? Maybe you could just speak to that. Uh, he was asking about how do, how do we assess the, the impact of the various structures. Is it the content? Is it the platform? Is it the design? Is it the, the strategy? Um, have, I, have I captured it accurately? accurately? The thing that, um, uh, this is where I come in and I have to take off my learning as a science hat and scientist hat and I have to put on my teaching hat. My, pri my first priority is I want more students to be successful. And if they can do it with our tool, great. I know that there's some strategies, and I know that the platform is there. What, that's the first and foremost question for us. We've not yet started thinking about how do we compare to others. I'm not saying it's not important. But for me as an educator, I want my students to be successful. And if someone can show me a more successful way, yet, as much as it would kill me, I would drop this and I would go to that. And I know there are very successful methods out there. What we've done is we've, we've taken the mindset um, that, and this, this is something that does make me very popular, is I believe that we know a lot about learning already. And we keep putting a finer and finer point on it um, through doing finer and finer research. And what's lagging behind 
is the actual getting it out there with students. And uh, what, brought, what has brought this primarily to the head is my most recent conversation with a program officer at the NSF, um, where they were, where we actually had to remove the core element of BioBook from the grant in order to make all the assessment and um, evaluation parameters work. So we had, to, we had to gut the fundamental element in order to make it happen. So that's the reason I'm, I'm focusing primarily on I want the students to learn. And I'm not going to worry how they get there. Because one of the things that's interesting is if you talk, and, and I've done this, is in talking to faculty in smaller institutions, their primary goal is they want their students to succeed and they don't really care how they get there. But, and I'm, I'm sorry, that came out a little too glib. Um, they, do, they do care how they get there. What, they're not as concerned about knowing every last detail about every last step along the way. Their goal is to get their population that they care very much about to the finish line. So we focused on getting that answer first. Now, what if, again, it goes back to the number of hands in the pot. Um, if, if we had 10 more people, we could do a lot more. Um, and I wish we did. So that's the next grant.